Okay, hi. This is Mr. Gale. I'm uh, making this little video from Canada because it looks like I am not going to be able to make it into Suzhou until a little later. In fact, I am currently scheduled to be leaving on the 14th, so you should see me in Suzhou at that time. Until then, uh, I'm going to have some other teachers covering for the time being. I'm sure they're quite capable, probably know it even better than I do. So I don't think there's going to be too much of a trouble and I don't want to get you too disrupted. But I also want to make sure that you know what to expect as soon as I get there, just so that there's no surprises. So before I continue, I want to go through a few things just to make sure that we're all on the same page. First off, uh, I am currently putting all of my work, uh, things like worksheets, uh, notes, uh, information about upcoming tests, that kind of thing, they're all going on an Edmodo site. Now this is just a website where I currently have all my stuff. I will be changing it into a QQ site in the future, but until then, I want you to sign up onto the Edmodo site so that I can uh, see you, I can post uh, news to you, and you can get all the worksheets and whatnot that you need from me. Now, uh, it looks, let me see, let me find it here, it looks like that. So once you get on there, the password and the, and the, there's, there's the group code over there, but you don't need to see that right there. Right now, what you can, what you do know is that your teacher will have the website and the password to get on here. So please ask them for, for that information. What you'll notice also is that here I can uh, post things. So uh, I haven't posted anything yet, but I'm going to start putting things up soon enough by saying hello and what's happening. And also you'll notice that there's a section here. Look right there. It says folders. If you go in folders, I already have the first two folders set up. Uh, one is general, which is going to, if you, let's pop that open right now. All it has is the textbook. This is your online textbook that uh, we're going to be using occasionally. Most of what we do is not going to be involving a textbook, but we will use some of the chapters. And if you look at your course outline, you will see that every topic has a related chapter and pages to look at in the McGraw Hill. So if you want extra work, extra things to look at, you want to read more about what I'm teaching, you can go to this textbook to get some help. Very soon I'm going to pop up the course outline into this into this folder as well. You also notice, let me see, if I go to sequence and series, there is already some review sheets and extra work for you to look at if you want. Now that's more once you've done a bit of work already, you can look at that. But I start adding things to these folders as we go. I also add new folders for you to look at. Um, very useful site for me just to make sure that everybody knows what's going on. So please, when you get a chance, I want you to sign up as soon as you can to this site. So that's at Modo. Now, the way I teach uh, is generally going to be covering every topic, but once in a while, probably about every second week on a Friday, because Fridays are always the more, uh, let's say, slow class, we're tired, it's been a long week, we don't want to work as hard as we would maybe on a Tuesday. So Fridays, some of the Fridays, I have what I call tangents. And those are classes where we're going to do math, but it's going to be more, more like the kind of math that's involved with gameplay and uh, game analysis and, and fun puzzles and stuff like that. A little bit of a distraction. Uh, this course shouldn't uh, require every single day to be teaching everything as hard as we can because uh, we have a lot of time to go through all these topics. Uh, it should be a fairly uh, relaxing class, uh, provided that we do the work when we have to do the work. So we're going to have a few days uh, every once in a while to have some fun. So uh, hopefully that'll be uh, something you like too. You're going to have to let me know when we do them. Now, what else do I want to talk about? Well, I guess really what I want to talk about now is uh, math. Yeah. Let's talk about math for a little bit. Consider this uh, a little introduction to the course. 
And in this, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about uh, a little history lesson. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I can tell you about where math started. Now, if we're going to talk about math and where it starts from, uh, we really have only a few different civilizations that were building up math at the same time. The, the biggies uh, were probably uh, Babylonia. Uh, this is around 2100 BC. Uh, China was doing really amazing stuff really early, around 1500 BC. The Chinese were already doing uh, decimal fractions, decimals. They were using decimals 1500 BC, which is roughly um, about, well, let's say, a good 2,000 years before Europe. Europe didn't have a clue about decimals. They were using this horrible system. I don't know if you know much about this, but um, let's just pop this up, okay? If I wanted to write down, uh, say, uh, say 20, 20, 24, right? I want to write 24, and I was living in Europe around 1,000 AD. Uh, I would have to write down uh, da, 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 which meant... Uh, uh, 10 plus uh, 10 uh, plus plus what? Uh, 5 minus 1. Oh my god, that's horrible. Yeah, I mean, it's really, really bad because imagine if I said, okay, what is uh, 24 plus, I don't know, 32? 32. 32. How do I do this? And you can see the problem already happening. I can't just do what? What, what is that? Do, do I do I do I just add up all the x's? Is is this what I do? Do I just go one, two, three, and eh? it, is that right? I I don't even know. I, I actually I do know. That's that's totally wrong. That's not how it works at all. It's it's a horrible. Ah, I hate it. It's it's a really really bad system. Actually, it doesn't work at all. It's it's and so we have basically. Uh, the Chinese, as well as uh, the Arabs in the Middle East, to thank us, to, to, to be to basically be deeply thankful for the fact that they brought in uh, a very special number, uh, this number, ooh, zero. They brought in the zero. The Chinese knew about zero, and the Middle Eastern Arabs knew about zero, and it's because of them that we actually have a lot of great things uh, in mathematics that the Europeans really had forgotten. Uh, and, and, and this is kind of really funny because this kind of stuff was well known by most, most people and then just got forgotten totally by all of Europe. But where was it coming from in the first place? Well, there's, there's two civilizations that are really important as far as uh, mathematics is concerned. The first one are the, the Egyptians. The Egyptians were interesting because uh, they they were using uh, a base uh, 10 system. Now, you think, well, everyone uses base 10, right? Because why do we use base 10? And when I mean base 10, I mean we use uh, uh, 1, 0, 0. What does, what does, one, let me draw that bigger. What does 100, what does 100, how do, how do I read that? Well, that means 1, 1, 100 plus zero tens plus zero ones. All right, this is base 10. This is the system that we use. Uh, what's interesting is that most people did not use base 10. Most people used uh, base 12 or base 24. Now, why, why is 24 better than 10. Why is it better than 10? I mean, we've always assumed everybody used 10 because we have 10 fingers, 10 toes. But if you think about it, uh, our, our months are divided into 12, half of 24, and our hours, the hours of the day is divided into 24 hours. Now, why did we do that? Why was that smart? Well, you can thank math for that. Math, it makes absolutely more sense to do 24. Let's look at 10. I can divide 10 into how many different ways? Well, I can do 1, 
these are the prime factors. I get one, two, I can divide by five, and divide by ten. That's that's it. That's that's all I got. So if I have a circle and I'm dividing up the circle, I can divide up into five parts or two parts pretty easily. But uh, anything else is a little difficult, really difficult. And so what about 24? Well, I can divide 24 into 1, 2, I can divide by 3, I can divide by 4, uh, 6, 8, holy cow, 12, 24. The, the, the number of ways you can divide up 24 is so many more variations. And so this gives you the idea of why 24 was so much cooler for everybody than 10. So it was actually really strange that we used base 10 at some point. Why didn't we use base 12 or base 24? It made more sense. And that's actually most civilizations used base 12, base 24. But the Egyptians were a little special. They used base 10. And the reason for that is because they didn't know how to add and uh, subtract. Well, they knew how to add and subtract in the traditional way. But what they didn't know how to do was multiply. Until they came up with a really, really cool way of doing it. Okay. Because the Egyptians were the first people to use the binary system. Now, what is binary? Binary is... Uh, one zero one one zero. You you've seen this. Computers talk this way. One zero one one zero one zero one 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 zero 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 zero. Ones and zeros. Binary means I'm only using ones and zeros. So if I want to write uh, the number, let's say, pick a number seven. Let's say we're going to do seven. Then I would have to say, okay, what is seven? That would be uh, one one. So this is the ones column. This is the twos column, this is the fours column, this is the four times two eights column. So how do I do this? Well, um, I'd have to say, well, it's, there's no eights, because if I'm trying to say seven, I have to say, okay, one, four, one, two, and one, one. Four plus two plus one gives me seven, so seven is equal to one, one, one in binary. That's how I write down seven in binary. It looks like 111. Really, I should be careful about what I say here. It's not really the ones, the twos, the fours, and the eights. It's the two to the power of zeros, the two to the powers of ones, the two to the powers of twos, and the twos to the powers of threes, and on and on and on and on and on. And each column is like that. When I say 123, whoa, that's not a three. That is totally not a three. I'm gonna, there we go. Perfect. What am I saying? Well, I'm putting 123 into three columns. This one is the 10 to the 0. This is the 10 to the 1s, and this is the 10s to the 2s, the 100s, the 10s, and the 1s. So when you look at that, it's the exact same system for binary. This is what the Egyptians worked with. So when they had figured out how to add and subtract, the next step was, okay, how do we do multiplication? And it's brilliant what they did. Okay, check this out. So let's say I want to do 17 times 23. Now what the Egyptians figured out was that there is no such thing as multiplying. Multi there is really no such thing as multiplying. What does 17 times 23 really mean? What it means is, what if I added up 17 23s? If I said 23 plus 23 plus 23 plus 23, on and on and on, until I got 17 of them in a row, and then I added them all up. So if I know that that's what I'm doing, then maybe I can do it in a different system. And so they said, okay, here's what you do. Here's what you do. On one column, you do, well, two to the power of zero, two to the power of one, two to the power of two, two to the power of three, two to the power of four. You go one, two, four, eight, 16. And the simple thing is that all you're doing is doubling each time. One times two, two times two, four times two, eight times two and on and on and on. The next swing would be 32. The next after that would be 64. And on and on and on and on. And then on the next side, what you do is you take your number over here, your 23, and then you double it as well. 23 times 2, 46 times 2, 92 times 2. And you do that. So you have two columns. Okay, what's the next step? Well, then what you do is you look at your first column here and you say, okay, what numbers 
give me 17. Well, 17 would be 16 plus 1. 16 and 1 gives me 17. And no matter what this number is, you can make it with this column, no matter what. That's just one of those neat little things going on here. Every single number that exists can be made by making a column like this and picking out the right numbers. Right? If I wanted to pick 3, 3 would be the 1 and the 2. But in this case, it's 17, 1, and the 16. So what I do is I go over here. Hmm, 16 is 368. 1 is 23. I add up 23 and 368. I get 391. Voila! 17 times 23 is 391. So they never did multiplication. They never learned multiplication tables. They never did it that way. The Egyptians did it entirely in this weird binary system. So in fact, they were using the language of computers thousands and thousands of years before there were computers at all. Now, one thing to think about, though, is where did they get all this? Where did this all come from? There really is a root in European uh, and, well, European, African, and Middle Eastern mathematics. And most of it, when we're talking about where math really comes from, we talk about the Greeks. Now, why are the Greeks so important? You always hear this. Oh, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, they're so, they're so smart. Why do people really care about the Greeks so much? Like I said, the Chinese had decimals in 1500 BC. We had the Babylonians doing stuff. And, oh my God, when were the Babylonians? I've got to look this up. When were the Babylonians? Babylonians were doing stuff in 2100 BC. India was doing stuff in 1200 BC. So, the Greeks, if anything, we're talking the Greeks are around from 600 to 300 BC. They're much later. So why are they so important? They seem like they came late to the game. The big difference with the Greeks is that they were the first people to say, how can I prove it? They were the first people to set down laws, rules, theories. Nobody had ever done that before. And this is what makes them so important, is that they created a set of laws of how math is true no matter what. They proved these things. And this becomes the basis for all math in the future. So everybody, everybody relies upon uh, the Greeks for that kind of thing. And, and they were really groovy people. We had a lot of people doing really neat stuff. And one of the things they wanted to know, though, and, and this is a really, really good question. For the Greeks really argued this a lot. Is math a language or is it a universal? And, and what do I mean by that? Okay, the question is, and, and this comes up a lot in, say, physics. I, I teach physics as well, so I'm really into this question. The thing is, is, is math something that it's a language? In other words, is it something that we invented? It comes from our brains and our brains only. If you were on, say, another planet, there might be no math. No math would exist, and, and you could go through it, and there, it doesn't exist anywhere on that other planet. But we happen to be uh, a species. Humans make math. Now, the other option is, is math something that is always been there? Is it something uh, that came from somewhere else, and we're just discovering the math that's out there? It was always there. And at some point, we found the math. We didn't create it. We found it. And that's a big question. Now, the Greeks were really into the idea that math was something that was universal. They felt that what they had found was the key to the gods, that they had found a way of tapping into the divine and to the, to the universe itself, the, the keys to how it worked and everything. And they had good reason to think that. They had really good reasons to think that. And I'll give you one example. Um, I've said this in the physics class already, so if you're in my physics class, you've probably already heard this. Here's a set of numbers. Now, uh, maybe someone in the class can shout out what this sequence of numbers is called. Go ahead, shout it out. Okay, maybe you did, maybe you did not. If you someone shouted out Fibonacci sequence, you are right. You are right, my friend. 
So how do you make this set of numbers? Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, what you're really doing is you're taking a 0, then 1, and then every number that follows you create by adding the two numbers before it. So 1, well, how did I get that? 0 plus 1. 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. 1 plus 2 is 3. 2 plus 3 is 5. 3 plus 5 is 8. 5 plus 8 is 13. And on and on and on and on and on. This is a sequence known as the Fibonacci sequence. Now, this was something that was figured out first by the Greeks. Now, they hadn't really thought about it as anything important. They thought it looked neat. They were like, ooh, that's kind of cool. But what became really crazy is when they looked at the world around them. And they said, wait a minute, there's something really weird here. If I look at all the flowers in the world, any flower I see, and I count the number of petals on the flower, they will only be 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, on and on. Well, actually, not much more than 55. There's not too many flowers that have more than 55 petals. But no flower has, for example, 14 or 6 or 25 petals. Now I'm not ca I'm not talking about mutated flowers. We all know that you can get a four-leaf clover out there. Those are mutations. They we're not going to count those. But if you look at the what is typical of the flower, all flowers will only have the number of petals that are part of the Fibonacci sequence. That is crazy because the Greeks are going, okay, we made this really neat math thing. And then they look around, they said, oh my God, what is going on? And what would you think? What would you think is going on? Well, what they thought is that they had found the key to unlocking the secrets of the universe. Look what they've done. We've found this thing. And so, they never saw math as something that was created. They thought it was something that was given to them by the gods. Okay, so it's a very different attitude towards what that's all about. Um, now, there's some uh, pretty famous Greeks out there. One that you already know about, which was a really big one, is uh, Pythagoras. And check out what he says. Uh, read this for a moment. There is geometry... In the humming of the strings, there is music in the spacing of the spheres. What is he saying there? He's saying that even music has math in it. And even the spheres, in other words, he's talking about the planets and the stars. Even the stars has a geometry, a math, a music. These are all the same thing. Everything has found its roots its roots in math. It's a pretty amazing thing. It's a very nice little poetic thing that he said there. Now, uh, let's talk about Pythagoras for a minute because we always kind of put uh, the Greeks up on pedestals. We, we treat them like they were so amazing. They were so great. They never did anything wrong. They were just the most amazing people. Well, let's be honest. Let's have a little bit of true history here and realize that, well, Pythagoras, especially Pythagoras, was totally, totally crazy, okay? Um, he did amazing things with math, but Pythagoras was not a normal guy, okay? This guy was a nut, okay? Let's, let's talk about him for a moment. Now, he wasn't simply a math teacher, okay? He, he taught all sorts of subjects, but what was important is that he actually created a school for students but it wasn't even just a school. It was more like a church. It was a way of making math as if it was magic. When people talked about Pythagoras, they talked about him as if he was a magician. His group was known as the Mathematikoi. The Mathematikoi were a very secret club of people who were taught the secrets of math. There are only the inner circle of students were allowed to talk to Pythagoras and learn his secrets about math. This was kind of a big thing because think about it. If you wanted to know some sort of mathematical 
thing. Uh, for example, you're building a boat. Now, if you're going to build a boat, you need to know exactly how big the ribs of the inside of your boat are going to be. And you're dealing with curves. You're dealing with things that are quite difficult to work out. And you would go to the secret cult of Pythagoras, the Pythagoreans. And you'd be like, I want to know exactly how to build this boat. And you would pass it over to them and they say, we will be back in a few days. And they would go away and they'd come back and be like, here is the secrets. Now, they wouldn't tell you how they came up with the numbers because that was the secret. And that's what made them seem like magicians to everybody else. It was so beyond everybody else that they saw it as magic. Now, Pythagoras was not simply a, a mathematician. He, he had a lot of other ideas. And this is what makes him kind of a fun guy to, to hear about. He believed that nobody should have worldly possessions. He refused to eat meat. He was a strict vegetarian. But he also hated, he hated beans. He was, he was totally, I don't mean a little, he was terribly, terribly afraid of beans. Okay. This was, this was something that he was totally scared by. Um, and, and believed that, uh, beans were something that w would infest his soul. He also taught that mathematics was, uh, the true reality of everything. And numbers themselves had mystical power. Every number had uh, a personality. In other words, some numbers, uh, like the number seven, were considered to be uh, feminine, uh, like a girl number. And uh, the number 12 was considered to be a, a man number. And he, he, he liked some numbers, and he didn't like some numbers. He thought some numbers were evil. He thought some numbers were ugly. He thought some numbers were... were were just absolutely beautiful. They're the most beautiful numbers in the world. So you had this kind of thing about like how these things would work. Now, this all went bad at one point because, well, we all know what Pythagoras is mostly known for, and that's the Pythagorean theorem. All right? And that's where we have a, a right triangle. You all know this. Uh, I have a right triangle, and I have a side A, I have a side B, and I have a hypotenuse known as C, and I also know that A squared plus B squared equals c squared. Now what this means is that I can always describe all of these sides as a real number. So a and b and c, all of these sides are the, now this is going to be a little bit of um, math terminology, but this means e means in the set of, in the the set of, we're going to be using these this term, and the set of real numbers, real numbers, numbers, sorry. Now, what does it mean to be a real number? Well, a real number, if I want to say something is a real number, that means I can describe it as a fraction. Any number that is a real number is something where I can put um, a let's say an X on the top and a Y on the bottom. And no matter what, uh, X and Y must be a whole number. That means a, uh, a set of the whole numbers, which means uh, like a one, a two, a three, a four, da, 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 da. All right, so for example, uh, three quarters is a real number. Uh, two, two is a real number because I can describe it as two over one. So that's considered a real number. Now, what happened is that some students of Pythagoras said, we, we've got a problem. We've got a big problem. Because Pythagoras said, this is absolutely true. It cannot, no matter what, this will always happen where A, B, and C are real numbers. Well, they said, well, wait a minute. What if you did one and one? Uh, 45 degree right triangle. Well, one squared plus one squared square rooted must equal C. That's the square root of two. Now, I don't know about you, but if you haven't looked at that before, number two, the root square root of two is not real. It's not a real number. If you try it on your calculator, you're going to get an answer. But in reality, uh, there are no two numbers like a like an a over b some sort of 
two numbers that will give you the square root of 2 exactly. Square root of 2 is one of those things that's sort of like pi. Pi uh, 3.1416, blah, 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 blah. Will go on forever, forever. And if it goes on forever, it's impossible to create a fraction that will give you the exact number. It's not real. This is actually known as a irrational number. It's, well, it's real, but it's the irrational real number. These are rational real numbers. My apologies. I'm kind of saying this a little bit wrong. But Pythagoras says, no, this number, square root of 2, that must be able to be written in some way where I have an A and a B. And he tried for many, many years to do this until these two guys, these two students, uh, proved it. They proved, listen, you're never going to get it. It's impossible. This thing is not a rational number. So what did he do? Well, he went out into a boat. Here's a boat. Uh, he went out into the ocean. And he took, uh, here's, here's Pythagoras here, with his beard. And he, he threw out their proof. Here's the proof. Whee! And he threw it in the ocean. Blah, 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 blah. And he put rocks around those two guys. Tied them up. And threw them into the ocean. Ah! I'll make them scream. Ah! And threw them and, and killed them. He, he killed his students because they proved something that <laughs> was wrong. And uh, this is who Pythagoras was. He's a bit of a murderer, actually. Uh, did really bad things. In fact, um, it's what's even interesting is that how he died. Uh, Pythagoras uh, was doing all sorts of kooky things. And uh, eventually the people of the town really... Uh, they, he was hanging out in his big temple. We'll just draw the temple here. Mm, temple. Here's the temple. And and all the townspeople went, ah, well, here's the temple. Rawr. Here, here's one person. Here's another person. Rawr, I'm going to get you. And they and they scared him. He went, and he was like, ah, oh my God. So he ran. He, run, he, runs, he runs away. He runs away. And, he, and he's running. Here, here. Uh, shoot. Got to draw this real fast. Here he is. Running away. And then what does he come to? What's... You know what this is? You know what this is? He runs and then it is a field of... A field of beans! He actually runs into a field of beans. And so he... So he stops. He stops. He stops right where he is, a giant crazy mob that's going to kill him, and then they actually reach him, and he says, better to die by the hands of a mob than to stand in a field of beans. So he actually died, basically because of his old fear of beans. Very exciting. Poor Pythagoras. Anyway, that was Pythagoras. Uh, that was something... Uh, that was kind of interesting in Greek history. You've always got to remember that the things that people say back then, uh, we, we have this idea that the Greeks were amazing and everything. Well, you know, not always. Not always. They were human like all of us, which is kind of nice to know because it means that even you, as little humans like myself, we can create uh, amazing things with math just like they did. There's no reason why they are somehow so much more better than us. Although they did some amazing things. It obviously took a lot of hard work and it would take you a lot of hard work as well to come up with stuff equivalent to what they did. Now, what else do I want to talk about? Well, they had this idea. They said, listen, uh, math is a universal thing. It's this perfect, amazing thing that comes from somewhere, the gods. But there was already back then proof that perhaps they were wrong about that, perhaps. And uh, one person in particular who made a point about this was this guy called Zeno. Now Zeno was really in, interested in, in, in the concept of infinity. He, he really liked this idea, but he also said there's some problems with what we're talking about. I, I can prove to you that there's things that don't make a lot of sense in math and, and it makes for things that are, well, something's wrong about them. Some, some, I, can, I can show you this. And he says, here's a good example. Let's say you're having a race. Now, in this race, we have uh, a man. We're going to call him Achilles. This is his name, Achilles. 
is running. And he's running a race against a turtle. And, uh, and they're trying to reach the end over here. And Achilles is so fast. Much, much faster than the turtle. He knows he's going to beat the turtle no matter what. So he says the turtle can start at the halfway point. He can start at a point halfway to the finish line and he'll still beat him. So Achilles says, uh, okay, but wait a minute. Let's just say one second has passed. Okay, so in one second, Achilles has run up and reached the halfway point. But when he's there, the turtle's not there anymore. Because the turtle, even though he's slow, has still moved ahead a little bit. So Achilles still has to reach the turtle. But when he reaches the point where the turtle was in another second, well, the turtle's moved ahead. So he's still got to reach where the turtle is now. So what happens? He's going to keep running and trying to reach where the turtle was, but the turtle will have moved ahead, no matter how small this distance is. And it's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller, because all he has to do is reach this little tiny point. And the turtle will only have moved a little tiny bit. But still, Achilles must reach that new point, but the turtle would have moved ahead. So according to Zeno, he says, I've proven to you that Achilles can never beat the turtle. Anybody who is running ahead of another person can never beat them. Now, we all know this is absolutely not true, but mathematically, how do you prove that it's not true? This became a big deal at the time. It got even worse with a guy named Gauss. Now, this is much, much later. But, it, but it's a nice thing to look at for a moment here. We all know that a triangle... If you add up all the angles, will give you 180 degrees. And since the time of the Greeks, it's been agreed that no matter what, if you add up those angles, you'll get 180 degrees. Now, it wasn't until Gauss, but Gauss proved that you can make a triangle that has more than 180 degrees. Now, think for a moment. Perhaps some of you know the answer to this. But how can you make a triangle that has more than 180 degrees, still with straight lines? Remember, it's still straight lines making all the, uh, the, the parts of the triangle. So how do you do that? Well, Gal said, it's pretty simple to think about. You just have to, you know, consider something. Imagine you're not walking on a flat surface. You're walking on a curved surface. And the easiest curved surface to think about is a globe. And picture yourself walking along the equator of the Earth. And as you're walking along the equator of the Earth, I think we would all agree that as far as you're concerned, you can walk in a straight line. This is a straight line. It's a curved line in another direction, but as far as someone walking along that, they're moving in a straight line. Now, when you do it, now let's follow the path of a person walking along. They walk along and then they turn how many degrees? 90 degrees. So they're walking east and they turn 90 degrees to face north. And then they walk north in a straight line until they hit the North Pole. And then they turn another 90 degrees and now they're facing south. And they head south until they hit the equator. And then they turn again and they face the same line they start with. Now, that's 90 degrees plus 90 degrees plus 90 degrees. That is a 270 degree triangle. Now, this is kind of interesting because now what you're introducing is a whole new set of mathematics that has to be different because we're not dealing with a flat surface. Now, anybody walking on the Earth thinks they're on flat ground, so you wouldn't even know that you're on a curved surface, but you would start getting these strange measurements and say, well, gee, how is this working? In fact, there's a whole set of mathematics associated with that, also with uh, curved surfaces that are curving around, and also curved surfaces that are moving inwards. In other words, a triangle on this saddle, this kind of what we call a hyperbolic curve, is something that has less than 180 degrees on its triangle. So you can do all sorts of different mathematics with this thing. 
this is what's kind of neat about math is that it's it's a big question so we're gonna just to go back to what the greeks asked in the very very beginning is math a language or is it a universal no one really has a true answer to that but it's a wonderful thing to think about as we go back and forth on that where sometimes we say well didn't we just invent that i mean if everything the greeks said was so true no matter what it's 100 percent true and can never be proven wrong and then suddenly people like Gauss say, well, wait a minute, uh, stick everything on a curve and what do you got? Or you have Zeno who says, well, wait a minute, uh, just play around with the idea that uh, the Achilles and the turtle and you'll never reach the end. And how can you prove stuff with that? You begin to get this idea that maybe math is also a language. Now, being a physicist, I, I personally feel my own personal thought is that math is a language but you can really easily get swayed to think that math is also something that is a universal thing that would always be there even if there were no humans there would always be math because when you look at the universe and you say gosh you know everything seems to be following these very strict rules that i can describe with numbers that makes you think that perhaps um, the math was there before we were there Anyway, that's all I want to talk about. That's uh, all I want to say about math. Um, good luck uh, for the first two weeks. Um, if you have any questions, you want to talk to me, by all means, uh, the course outline does have my email, so you can contact me if you want. Uh, yeah, hope you have fun, and I will see you all soon. Bye now.